Praise the Lord, Ramp DMV. Amen. Come on, let's clap our hands and give God a thunderous, 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 thunderous round of applause. Come on. And while you're clapping it, why don't you stand to your feet and begin to lift up your voice and give God the praise that he's so well deserving of. Come on, God has done it once again. He's done it again for his people. Come on. Come on, we give you glory, Jesus. We give you glory, oh God. We worship you, oh God. We worship you, oh King. Come on, don't get tired. You just began. Open up your mouth. Come on, like there's a trumpet in your throat. And begin to sound the alarm. Hey, glory to God. We give you glory. Whoa. Come on, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you and we praise you. We glorify you and we honor you. Why? Because there is none like you. There is none like you in all the earth. We've tried to find it in other things. We've tried to find a hope and the glory. We've tried to find a future. We've tried to find it in school systems. We've tried to find it in government. But we've only come to find out that there is only one name that's given unto heaven. Why would men just be saved? And it's through it by the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Father, for getting us throughout the week. Father, we thank you for taking us through dangers, seen and unseen. We glorify you because it's at that name that every knee must bow. And it's at that name that every tongue must confess that you are Lord, that you're the Savior, that you are our Redeemer, that you are our very present help in the time of trouble. And right now we call on you. We call on you because you're the only God that's still saving. You're the only God that can save. Why daddies die? Why mothers leave? Why Muhammad dies? Why Confucius leave? You're the same God today, yesterday, and forevermore. You're the same God that opened blind eyes. You're the same God that heals cancer and all matter of diseases. We clap our hands. Why? Because we have strength in them. We lift up our voice. Why? Because there's power in it. Life and death. It lies in the power of our tongue. And so we confess. Father, if there's anything that we've done that's not pleasing in your sight, we ask that you forgive us all knowingly and unknowingly. We don't want any distractions. We don't want to hinder the move. We don't want to hinder the move. We don't want to hinder your move. We want your spirit, Father, to flow freely in this house. Somebody's in need, in need of a blessing. Somebody's in need, need of restoring. God be the restorer. In the name of Jesus, Father, I ask you, Lord, God, commit this service into your hands, Father. In the name of Jesus, touch our praise team. Touch Elder Bernard. He's been moving all week, Father. His body might be tired, but his spirit is willing. God, in the name of Jesus, put a trumpet in his throat. Help him to sound the alarm on the holy mountain. In the name of Jesus. And Father God, we pray for our assistant pastor. We thank you, Lord, for these two years of service and the service that's gone beyond. In the mighty name of Jesus, hold him up, Father, with your free spirit. In the name of Jesus, continue to encourage him and take him to another level in you. We pray, Father, for our leader, for our bishop, Bishop S.Y. Younger. In the name of Jesus, while other leaders have died and while other bishops are sleeping, you still have him as a voice to this nation. In the name of Jesus, declaring that holiness is still right and that there is a oneness and there is one way. In Jesus, he's still the way. 
Now touch your neighbor and pray for your neighbor because they're in need, they're in need of a breakthrough. And their breakthrough just might be tied to what your anointing lies. In the name of Jesus, you know them individual by individual, flow from heart to heart and breast to breast. You know their situation. You know what they're in the need of. We ask God that you grant it. Kind Father in Jesus' name. If you do these things, we'll forever give your name praise. And we'll be so careful, Father, to give you honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you agree with that prayer, can I get you to clap your hands and give God a great shout of praise all in the house? Come on, can you lift your voice and give him glory? Give him honor. Give him praise. Well, happy anniversary, Ramp d and b We're two years old. God has kept us. Do me a favor. Look to the left and to the right and tell somebody, I'm so glad you made it to celebrate with us tonight. Come to celebrate. Find somebody and tell them, I'm so glad you made to celebrate with us tonight. You made it. Tell them something good is getting ready to happen because Jesus is passing by. This is what I need to happen for the next 60 seconds. I need everybody under the sound of my voice to clap your hands and open up your mouth and give God the greatest shout of praise that you can give him. Come on, that's it. Can you clap your hands and open your mouth and give him glory? Come on, that's it, give them glory. I see you clapping, but I need you to release a sound in the room. Come on, release a sound in the room. Come on, release a sound in your, throw your voice like an arrow and release a sound in the room. Come on, we give them glory. We give them glory. We give them glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Do me a favor, look at somebody and tell them I'm so glad he's my rock tonight. Tell them I'm so glad he's my rock tonight. Do me a favor, can you just clap your hands? Come on. Oh, come on, it feels good in here. I need you to clap your hands.
And I will, I will echo that. I will, you know, Bishop said the reason why he could do this is because of what, and there's some real truth to that. There's been some moments when I'm like, where's Bishop? He's in D.C. Oh, <laughs> we got to do something. Amen. good to be here and, and we're happy to share him with you. Amen? We're happy about what God is doing here uh, through him and through all of you. Amen? So, um, can I tell a quick story, Bishop? Yes. Hallelujah. There was once a king and he had a beautiful kingdom and he had one son. And the kingdom went to war, and the son came, the prince came to his father, and he said, Dad, I want to go to war. He said, you do not have to do that. You stay right here in the castle with your mother and I. You do not have to go to war. But he said, Dad, I want to go to war for our people. And he couldn't stop him. And the prince went to war and was killed. Now, the prince had a friend that lived down the way who was an artist. And, and if the prince's friend knew that the father was a great collector of art. He had a, a huge collection of art. And after the prince had died, the prince's best friend came and knocked on the door of the castle. And the king came to the door and opened it, and he saw his son's best friend. And he said, I know that you're a collector of art, king, but I did a portrait of your son, and I wanted you to have it. Now, it wasn't that good. His friend was just beginning in art. It wasn't that pretty art. And years later, the king passes away, and they're auctioning off all the famous art that the king had collected over the years. And all the fancy folks are coming to bid on Monet and, and Rembrandt and all of this famous artwork. Everybody's in the room, and the, and the auction's about to begin. And the auctioneer steps up, and he says, Now, listen, the estate clearly reads that the first piece to be auctioned off was the painting of his son. Now, it wasn't that attractive, and he says, could I get, could we start this auction with a $100 bid for this painting? And people are like, what are we, I didn't even come here for that. I came for this Rembrandt over here. I came for this, I came for that. And he said, no, 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 the estate clearly reads that this one must be the first one, so nobody's bidding. $100, $50, $20. Finally, he said, listen, will somebody please give me $5 so we can move on with it? And the old butler who had served them for years in the back stood up and he said, I will. I'll give five. He said, get sold to the man. And he came forward to get it. And the auctioneer closed up the book. And he said, auction's over. And they said, what do you mean? I came thousands of miles to bid on this one and this one. And he said, no, 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 auction. The estate clearly reads... He who gets the sun gets it all. I'm here to tell you, Red DMV, whoever gets the sun gets it all. Whoever gets the sun gets it all. Tell your neighbor, I'm so glad I got the sun. So, I'm going to ask for greetings from the first female that was ever ordained in the ramp movement in our 18 years of existence. Evangelist Jamesia Harrison from Atlanta, Georgia. Come on, that's good for me, but can you put a clap in your hands and a praise on your lips and magnify the Lord God of your salvation? Come on, the 47th Division of Psalms says, clap your hands, all you people, and shout unto God. Come on, clap your hands and shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Hallelujah. Come on, Ram Church DMV, do you know what today is? It's your anniversary. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. Listen, listen, listen. You can ask me to do a whole lot of things. You can ask me to help you with your mathematics and I can't help you because that's not my strength. You can ask me to help you with your geography and I can't help you because that's not my strength. 
But if you ask me about the joy of the Lord, there I can help you because that is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Certainly I give honor to Christ who is the head of my life. And I would be remiss if I did not honor the man of God, my spiritual father. He is named among the ecclesiastical elite, his grace. Bishop S.Y. Younger, can y'all help me celebrate my spiritual father? I love you, Bishop. I love you for real. Amen. And to my best friend that's helping him with this work, Pastor Samuel Gillespie, can we thank God so much for him? I'm proud of you, best friend. Glory be to God. But Ram Church DMV, know that I love you. Know that I'm consistently praying for you. I'm excited about what God is doing in your life. Will you look at your neighbor and say, doors of acceleration are opening for me now. Doors of acceleration are opening for me now. Doors of acceleration are opening for me now. You want to place them like you already got it. God bless you. Man, we got family here today, right? That's what happens when we have a birthday celebration. It's just such a blessing to have all of you here today. I'm looking in the audience. I see uh, some pastors uh, with us. Where's my pastor friend from our Christian life? Stand, stand up, pastor. Come on. Let's thank God for him. We love you. I mean, you're really like a member of our church. I want y'all to clap your hands for him. He's here almost every Sunday. And, and it just blessed my heart to look and see. Bishop Perry Jenkins is with us today. Wave your hand, Bishop Jenkins. Amen. And I, I see worship pastor, Kenneth Smith. It is so good to see you here. I still love you, even after you took one of my favorite church members, Keisha. I still love you. And so I guess now you are part of our family. And we are so thankful for you. I saw Pastor Talton came in. Where is he at? He stepped outside the park. He's called. Well, his wife is here. Wave your hand. Let's thank God. Come on, Ram Church. Uh, and this morning, one of our pastors from the UK uh, and uh, Maryland came and popped up and surprised us this morning. And his wife is surprising us this evening. And some of their members are here. Stand up, Lady Mayo. We love you. That's the first lady of the fourth diocese of the One Way Churches International. Fourth is the best, right? Yes. That is so complicated for me. I'm a part of like three dioceses, amen. And uh, we just, we just, I'm just looking around. I'm seeing so many of y'all, and I was just so blessed today. One of my friends from Saint Vincent, who now is a part of the UK military, he this is his first time in Black Pentecostal American Church, uh, and he's so here. Kyron, wave your hand. Thank you for being here. Let's thank the Lord for him. Amen. I tell you, I feel church in here tonight. I tell you, I feel church tonight. If you are a pastor and I didn't call your name, will you stand? I would like to acknowledge you. I really would like to acknowledge you. Did I get all the pastors? All right. Pa oh, yes. My friends from Baltimore. Come on. Let's thank the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We're going to do this quickly. We're going to uh, receive our offering. And this will not be any different than any Sunday. Uh, we are asking for a special offering. But we don't believe in taking a long time to receive an offering. Amen. Because we purpose in our heart what to give. And where a man's heart is, you know, that's where his treasure is. I did ask some of our members if you would uh, stand with me today. We're sowing $200 today because it's our second anniversary. If you stand with us, and if you would like to become an honorary member today, you stand with $200. Come on, stand quickly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, why are we uh, giving special offerings? Because we need, a, we need another church. Amen. We need, we need to be able to expand. And we thank God for Bishop Rowe and his church, how they've accommodated us. Oh, come on. Two years. I see y'all standing on the balcony. The rest of you, you may not have $200. You may be giving $100. Come on, stand with us. You may be giving $50. So whatever you're giving, just stand. We're not auctioning off blessings because what God is going to do for you, you can't pay for it. Amen. But I will sow into it. I will sow into it. If you're Given electronically on Cash App, it's dollar sign Ram Church DMV. And the ushers are in the aisles, and every aisle they have a QR code if you need assistance. 
Everyone stand with an offering in your hand. Thank you, Lord Jesus. no one while we give, okay? Can we do that? I want to move quickly. Everyone giving, uh, whether you're giving your tithe, and some of you are giving your tithe, put it in your hand, and we'll declare today we place our tithe in our right hand as a sign that we're giving God what's right and what? what not what's left. My tithe is a symbol of, of my trusting God, knowing that he can do more with the tenth than I can do with the ninety. Whether you're giving a thousand dollars or whether you're giving one dollar, hold it up, shout, I have because I give. And I give because I have. Therefore, I shall never be blessed. No, no. I'll never be broke another day in my life. Listen, if you're given a tangible offering, will you walk from where you are and bring it to the front? If you're given electronically, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Anybody know that there's no God like the God that we serve? Yeah, 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 yeah. We see, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go, right here. We see, yeah. Dead. 
confess and doing what God told you to do. Speaking the word, even though it may not make everybody happy, but you did what God told you to do. And as long as you're doing what God telling you to do, and God getting the glory out of what you saying to his people, that's who the most the glory comes from. Yeah. And thank God for the grace of you putting you on you in my life and in all of our lives here. We appreciate you so much. I'm swallowing through the car. Thanks for being who you are and doing what you do. You're appreciated more than you know. Thank you for sharing God's love, not only with your words, but also with your life. We appreciate your time, your gifts, and your talents for every sacrifice. Thank you. May God continue to cover you, keep you, strengthen you, and may his peace and favor surround you. Be blessed all the days of your life. We love you, Ramp DMV. Whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. John 15, 16. When Jesus chose you for a life of special service, he blessed you with the strength and dedication you would need to bring his message to others. You have served him faithfully, and your work has borne fruit, just as he promised. On your second anniversary as, the, as our pastor slash bishop at Grand Church DMV, May he bless you with all the happiness that only Jesus can give. Bishop S.Y. Younger, thank you for your continuous yes. Thank you for coming up and down the highways every Tuesdays and Sundays and, and Fridays. We appreciate you. Thank you for just being here.
said if I, if I be lifted up from your arms, oh, 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 lift him up. Come on, lift it up. Come on, church. Lift him up. Still he speaks from eternity. Come on. He said if I, if I be lifted up. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for how you brought us uh, to the climax of a year that we can declare that it's by your grace and your mercy that we made it, and not by the merit of our strength and our skills. But it wasn't by might nor by power. But it was really by your spirit. Because lest you build the house, them that labor, they labor in vain. Unless you keep the city, whew, the watchman watcheth in vain. So we say thank you, Lord. How you kept us from seeing and, and unseen danger. Things in the natural and the spiritual realm, you covered us. That the enemy came against us one way, but he had to flee seven ways. God, you've been faithful. Hallelujah. God, you've been faithful. Even moments that we were not faithful, God, you've been faithful. And we praise you. Bless us in the remainder of this service. That your name will be magnified in this place. We give you praise in all things as in Jesus' name. Somebody clap your hands like thunder and give him praise. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. God is so faithful, isn't it? Thank you so much for being with us. And we've honored so many preachers. And even as I look up, uh, two more uh, individuals surprised me today. And we are so blessed for the first time. They're classically trained and prophetic Levite, a man of God who's ministered all around the world, and he thought it not robbery to stop at our church here in D.C., Bishop Damien Sneed. We honor you. And we honor you. We honor you. And this woman of God whose voice has been all through this country releasing the sound of victory and deliverance. Evangelist Valerie Boyd is with us. Wow. Wow. So it's just a blessing. You know, people don't have to be nice. And how our schedules are, preachers just don't visit churches anymore. And it's not because of arrogance. Well, some of them, they're arrogant, but all of them are not arrogant. It's just that once you've been stretched uh, with schedules and itineraries, sometimes it's, it's hard to go visit. There are moments when I'm not in church and I don't have to be in church. I don't go. I go home and watch Netflix or, or sit on my patio and do nothing. See, people who are lazy, they call nothing boring. But tell your neighbor, I'm okay with nothing. I don't need no drama. I can get a bowl of cereal and just. Yeah. I'm serious. I can eat a bowl of cereal. See, some of you, because you don't know who you are, you can't go out to eat unless you invite people. You got to pay for them. I'm okay to walk in a restaurant. They say, how many? I said, I'm good with me. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, it took me a while to get there. If you grew up like I did in a house full of people, uh, some of us, we know what it is to have to share a bed with cousins and siblings. Wake up with somebody's feet near your head. And, you, know, you know, some of y'all bougie, you never had to do that stuff. But pallet on the floor. 
And so there are times when you have so always lived in a company and a crowd of people, being by yourself becomes awkward. But I realize that you don't know who you are until you discover who you are without the crowd. I need you to tell somebody, love people, but wear them like a loose garment. In other words, you're my outer garment. That means I want you, I love you, but if you choose to leave me, I won't be uncovered. Because I got a revelation that when God made me, he made me in his image and his likeness. He's El Shaddai. That means he's the self-sufficient one. To the point God is so one that when he needed a savior, he became the savior that he needed. He's so one. He became the son of himself to redeem man back unto himself. He's so Eckhart. He's so one. Many of us are about to get the revelation that what we are looking for, we already got. Oh, God. I need you to tell somebody, you got everything you need for the season you just walked in. I need somebody to receive that. I got everything I need. I'm my own co-signer. I'm my own affirmer. Somebody scream, I got everything I need. Now y'all didn't say it like you believe it. Come on, don't touch your neighbor, touch yourself. Shout, I got everything I need for the season I'm in. Woo. Hey. I can, I can finally testify that I'm not broken anymore. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It took me a while to be able to testify. But there were some bad decisions I made because I was broken. Oh, y'all not saying nothing to me here. There were some toxic relationships I was in. And I can't be mad at the other person. I was just simply broken. Oh, but I'm on the other side of it now. I'm not ministering from a broken place. I'm ministering from a healed place. And I need you to tell your neighbor, this feels better. Stop normalizing your dysfunction and come into wholeness. Pull on somebody, tell them, come over here. Where the table is spread and the feast of the Lord. But you need to know that it's possible. It's possible. Because it's hard to believe for something that you don't believe is possible. You hear me? It's hard to believe. Hallelujah. Somebody shall believe again. Y'all be seated. Y'all standing up like you're expecting something. Thank you, Lord. Somebody shall believe again. And this is my this has been our assignment coming to DMV was to agitate dormant believers. Because the Bible says in the last days, not many would depart from the church because some people never left the church, but they backslid. This said many would depart from the church. It said many shall depart from the faith. That means it's possible to do this and no longer believe in this. God told us to come up here about two years ago, hallelujah, to frustrate and give somebody a holy frustration that's been doing church and religion on autopilot. Hallelujah. God told me to come up here and stir the nest of some individuals. Hallelujah. They've been stuck doing the same thing over and over. Somebody shall believe again. And I want you to know that if God is stirring you to believe again, it's because there's something new on the horizon. I come to tell 75 prophetic people that's been praising without a revelation of your assignment. There's something new on the horizon. I need somebody to believe it in here. I need somebody to celebrate what's coming. Celebrate. Some of y'all are comfortable where you are. Oh, I said some of you are good with where you are. But somebody shout, there's got to be more. There's got to be more. I'm going to go really quickly. There's got to be more. There's got to be more. I want to go really quickly to the scripture. I've been in church. I've been in church every day this week. I've traveled uh, all, all this week.
And I thank you all for your prayers. Not only your prayers, many of you showed up in Atlanta. You showed up in different cities. And I'm, I'm honored and humbled by it to the staff that always keeps dropping me off uh, like I'm a baby with a diaper bag and passing me over to the next person. I want to thank you so much. Amen. For the early morning trips to the airport. Come on. You got to thank God for the people. Amen. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Thank you so much for, for your assistance. And I was not uh, scheduled to preach tonight. Uh, Overseer Risha from the Ram Church, Texas, was going to preach. Uh, he ended up in the hospital on, earlier this week. We're thankful that he got out, but we want him to re fully recover before he comes into cabin pressure. Amen. We got a telephone call last week to pray for a young lady at our church in West Virginia, Pastor B.J. Roberts Church. She got baptized in the name of Jesus, and then she uh, ended up with a, a physical affliction, and she got rushed to the hospital. They put her on a ventilator, and she was in ICU. Pastor Roberts says, Bishop, I need you and the intercessors to pray because they told her mother to start planning her funeral. That was Thursday of last week. Today she was in church. <laughs> Some of y'all don't know when to praise. The point of that testimony is that your situation is not so bad that you can't recover. Put your hands on somebody's shoulder. Tell them it's not so bad that you can't recover. Give me a few moments. I want to go to the word of God. See, we always talk about uh, the miracle of Lazarus. And it, it definitely is a miracle. It's that John text says that Lazarus was dead. And, the, and Jesus got him out the grave. That is a miracle. But I think we shout so fast that we jump over a detail. Hear me, Pastor Talk. That there's a miracle that Lazarus came out of the grave. But what is even a greater miracle before that miracle is that Jesus stood at the opening of the tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth. Yes, it is a miracle that he came out of the tomb. But there's another miracle that's in the details. That Jesus stood in the opening of a dark space and called out to a man that was dead and said, Lazarus, come forth. Bishop, Bishop, what are you saying? The point I'm trying to tell you is that a dead man don't supposed to be able to hear. If you can still hear, you can still recover. to recover. Go in your Bibles really quickly. You can still hear. Tell your neighbor, a dead man don't supposed to hear. All right. Hallelujah. He called me out of a dark place. I said he called me out of a dark place. Oh, y'all used to sing it. He brought me out of darkness into this marvelous light. Go, go really quickly. I'm going to read. Uh, let me tell you. I'll read four scriptures and I'll finish. And I'll talk to you just maybe ten minutes and we'll go home. Nahum chapter one. Nahum chapter one. Verse six through verse nine. Nahum chapter one. If you have a physical Bible, it may take you a moment to find it. <laughs> I mean, but all of you that on your smart device, just type in N A H U M. Nahum chapter 1, verse 6 to verse 9. I'm asking you to stand for the reverence of God's word. This is the last time I'll ask you to stand before we dismiss. Nahum chapter 1, verse 6 to verse 9. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury. And is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. 
the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knoweth them that trust him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof. And darkness shall pursue his enemies. Last verse. What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. Share this with your neighbor. You can be sit down. Tell them you will never have to face this again. Let me see the of the lack of Bible study and Bible reading in our present day church culture finding this book would be very complicated for a lot of us um, Nahum it's not Isaiah it's not, it's not Jeremiah it's Nahum Nahum is, has fallen among a group of books in what we call the Tanakh, uh, the books of the prophets. And it is labeled as a minor prophet. Oftentimes, the label minor uh, could be misleading. Minor. It's not minor because of its message. It's only minor because of its size. But I want you to know there are some major messages in minor places. Ooh, glory be to God. It don't have to be big to be powerful. Hallelujah. I want to declare to you today, here in the book of Nahum, uh, there is much debate and discussion concerning uh, his background. Uh, scripture tells us that he's an Elkoshite. And if you try to uh, go to Travelocity uh, to book a flight or get a resort at El Kashite, it'll be hard for you to find it. It's an ancient uh, community that no longer lives or exists under that label. But many people believe that it was in the region of the Galilee. One reason why there's a town in the days of Jesus called Capernaum. And the word Capernaum makes a reference to it's, it's the home or the abode of Nahum. Nahum. I haven't heard anybody name their son that lately. Nahum. But Nahum's name is a derivative of the name Nehemiah. I'm almost finished for real. <laughs> Nahum almost a short version of Nehemiah. What's important about that is the word Nehemiah means comforter. We know him as a builder, so we would think his name would mean builder, strong man, but it just means comforter. But if you don't have an understanding of the word comforter, you would think that's a soft or weak definition. But Jesus told his disciples, in John chapter 14, I will not leave you comfortless, but I'll send the Holy Ghost, the paraclete, the one that comes alongside. The Holy Ghost is a comforter. Oh my God. I, I, maybe because of our Pentecostal charismatic expression, we've made Holy Ghost just Kung Fu motions and we have minimized the Holy Ghost to glossolia xenoglossia, or what we call speaking in tongues. Maybe we've limited the Holy Ghost to the shifting of our feet and the clapping of our hands. Oh, but I thank God that the Holy Ghost is a 
comforter. Yes, Maybe that ain't important for some of y'all to celebrate, but when I look back over the last two years, there were some fragile moments that I had to endure. My, come on, y'all, talk to me here. There's some moments where my mind was slipping. There were moments where my heart was under pressure and I thought I was going to crush under the anxiety of the assignment. But the only reason why your sanity survived is because the Holy Ghost was a comforter. Ah, oh my God. The only reason why you were able to endure the grief that you went through, when you suffered the loss that made you feel like you could not get out of the bed tell your neighbor the Holy Ghost is a comforter I need you to look at somebody and I want you to tell them I thank God for the Holy Ghost no I want somebody to open up your mouth and clap your hands because the Holy Ghost kept you when you couldn't keep yourself the Holy Ghost kept you sane when you felt like you were losing it I said clap your hands and praise him because he is a comforter because just like Nehemiah, Nahum has an assignment that can make him feel isolated and alone. See, we have romanticized callings and giftings. Everybody want one, but not the one they got. Y'all talk to me in here. Social media has kept us connected, but it also has made us depressed. Because many of us were good. We were grateful and we were thankful until we got an eye into somebody else's profile. We didn't really get an eye into their life. We got an eye into their profile. It wasn't their life you saw on their timeline. It was their, y'all hear me, hear what I'm saying. It was their profile. And many of us are trying to compete our lives with somebody's profile. All they did was talk about God bless me with a new job. But they didn't tell you how many rejection letters they got before they got the job. All they tell you is about the vacation they own. But they don't tell you how many years they went before they had one. We want people's calling, but we don't know their cost. I need you to tell your neighbor, tell them I paid for this. And tell them, and I'm still making payments. I'm still making payments. Don't be jealous of something you don't know what somebody paid for. It. Nahum needs the Holy Ghost. Because the journey is lonely. No, the journey is lonely. It really is. That's why you need the, the comforter. Because what happens when the masses have exited? Or what happens when you're in the company of the masses? Huh. But there's no camaraderie. In other words, you can be in a crowd of people and still feel by yourself. Because everyone doesn't have your assignment. Stop taking advice from people who've never done what you're doing. Stop being blocked in with the advice of people that are not going where you're going and don't want to go. You know, it is it's very complicated uh, when I drive because it's probably why they don't let me drive now, but if I'm in a lane, my mind, once I stop, my mind starts moving. I'm making plans in my head. And sometimes if you're in a lane and there's somebody in the turning lane beside you, in your peripheral, when they move, you automatically think you have permission to move. But their light is different than your light. Hell yeah. I live in hotels, and this, this happens to me often, that I will be in an elevator with other people, I'm almost finished. And when they get off the elevator, don't y'all laugh at me, but I make the mistake of getting off just because they got off. Hallelujah. 
and, and that's a challenge because some of us are always ready to move when other people move but God's saying you can't move when they move because you're going on a higher floor and being in a higher floor means there's times you got to stand still when you want to run that means there are moments you got to stand in it when you want to resign there are moments you got to serve faithful when you want to abandon the spot uh, tell your neighbor everyone is not going where you're going does it mean, doesn't mean they're the devil. It means everybody don't have the same capacity. Hey, what God is calling you to do. And so Naomi needs the confidant. And, and this is why, and I want to say this to our church. I know we, are, we, we do teach dispensationalism that God deals with his people in different ways in different dispensations. And although we are Pentecostal and people would label us probably apostolic. I want to be clear with you that I don't believe that the Holy Ghost only showed up on the day of Pentecost. Yeah, I mean, don't y'all fight me, but some people said the Holy Ghost didn't come until the day of Pentecost. I have a challenge with that because in Genesis, the Bible said where there was chaos, the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters. I have a problem saying that the Holy Ghost didn't show up until the day of Pentecost because the Bible says once God had given Zerubbabel the assignment to rebuild the temple from its ruins. Zerubbabel says how will this happen? All I have is a measuring stick or a plummet in my hand and the scripture says Zechariah 4 and 6 is not by might nor by power but by my, oh, by my spirit. You can't tell me that the Holy Ghost didn't show up into Jerusalem AD 33 because I'm trying to find out how in the world did Elijah outrun Jezebel with men on horseback and he outran them on his feet the power of the Holy Ghost came upon I just said all that to say this the Holy Ghost was with some of us before we recognized it wasn't when you got to church it was the Holy Ghost that was keeping you when you were high off a weed God it was the Holy Ghost that was keeping you while some of us were drunk and don't know how we got home Tell your neighbor, the Holy Ghost has been with me the whole time. I didn't always obey. I didn't always yield. Oh, but there was something that was keeping me. It was something that kept me in the road. It was something that would not let me go so far. Tell your neighbor, I went far, but I didn't go too far. Come on. That even in my sin, I had a standard because of the Holy Ghost. Testify to somebody, tell them I had a standard in my sin. Oh. So you won't, you won't give Nahum too much credit. He wasn't a messianic prophet. We don't call him eagle eye as we do Isaiah. We don't even label him weeping as we do Jeremiah. We don't call him master prophet as we do Elijah. Oh, but Nahum, he's a symbol of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost don't just make you shout. Sometimes the Holy Ghost will make you cry. Uh, Y'all don't have that kind of Holy Ghost. Sometimes the Holy Ghost will chastise you and the Holy Ghost will correct you. Anybody here other than me, the Holy Ghost made you go and apologize to somebody that you really feel should be apologizing to you. You don't really have the Holy Ghost until you heard the Holy Ghost say, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut. Go in here and don't say nothing. Shut up. I'm telling you. The Holy Ghost will put a heaviness on you where you can't sleep until you get it right. See, I don't understand people. Now, all of us, all of us got flesh on us. I don't listen. Did you hear me? All of us got from the people who are sitting on this platform to the people said all of us got flesh on us. We have a treasure. We really do. We are prophets, we evangelists and pastors. We have this treasure. But the complicated thing about our treasure is that it's in an earthen vessel. 
and God did it on purpose that the excellency would be of God and not of us. We, we ain't none but some dressed up flesh in here. And so if God don't keep us, we won't be kept. But I got an issue with people who say they love God, but they never repent. My God, this grace, this hyper grace teaching has begun to tell us because what Christ did, there's no necessity of repentance. But I want you to know repentance is not just under the old covenant because in the apocalyptic book of the book of Revelation, I hope I'm not talking too much. In the apocalyptic book of the book of Revelation, when God tells John, write to the seven churches of Asia Minor, one of the strongest his words he says to the church of Asia Minor under the new covenant he says repent quickly see our issue is we used to repent quickly then we start repenting slowly now we didn't stop repenting at all we used to pray before we played we used to pray before we sing we used to pray before we used to say Lord forgive me for anything I did wrong knowingly or unknowingly commission or omission and that's why Ichabod has been written across the walls of a whole bunch of churches because a whole lot of people, hallelujah, want to serve but they don't want to repent. I need you to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, don't ever get above repenting. Don't ever get above a saying, Lord, I'm sorry. Don't ever get above it. This is the challenge. I'm sorry, I went a little further than what I expected. This is the challenge that Nahum is addressing. Nahum is addressing. This is what he's addressing. He's addressing arrogance. See, we made an error sometime of preaching that the God of the Old Testament is vengeful and judgmental and the God of the New Testament is merciful. Same God. No, no, Bishop. It can't be the same God. It can't be the same God. Because look how God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah in one day. No, the destruction was one day. But he negotiated with Abraham back and forth. Well, look how he sent the flood and destroyed everything. Yes, yes, yes. But how many years did Noah build and preach? Same God. He's always been merciful. But now we're dealing with something where people are wrong and strong uh oh let me get out of here I know this ain't an I didn't know I had to preach it I don't have an anniversary message this is the only message I have there used to be a time that if we were wrong we would be quiet if we were in sin we would be silent but now people are bold there's a bold demon that have rose up in our culture. There's a bold demon have raised up in our churches where you would do your dirt and post it and dare anybody to say anything about it. The book of Nahum is addressing arrogance. Now I'm going, I'm going to tell you right now. I may have done what some other people did. But tell your neighbor, I felt different about it. Come on, oh no, I did some stuff. Come on, tell somebody. Y'all, everybody get free in here. Come on, tell them. Tell you, I did some stuff. Come on, tell them, I did some stuff I don't want to talk about. I done did some stuff I don't want to remember. And I hope don't nobody else remember. There's some people that if I see them, I'm going to look straight and act like I forgot. Have you ever went past something that you wanted at one time? You got it. Now you said, what in the world was I thinking? I was broken. I was broken. I ain't testifying. So what happens is, Nahum has to address the fact. In chapter 1, he talks about God's power and God's strength. How mighty God is. And sometimes when we read the Psalms, we think the Psalms is just beautiful poetry. Mag oh, magnify the Lord with you. No, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All that, and all that stuff is beautiful. But if you just put your finger on a Psalm, you may get into a little other different language. When the Bible says, how terrible is our God. Same God. 
That means I would rather be on the right side of God than the wrong side of God. Well, when you look at the book of Nahum, his language is prophetic. I believe all prophecy oftentimes has a dual fulfillment. And I want to give you just some uh, examples of what I say when I say dual fulfillment. Because anytime God says something, something has to happen. But anytime a voice is released, there's also an echo. So if his if it's word goes out and you heard it, that's one fulfillment. But even his echo has to be fulfilled. Because he says, my word will go out, and when it go out, it cannot return void. So even if you didn't hear the word, but you heard the echo, that echo got to produce something. Oh, my God. Hear me, hear me. When I said dual fulfillment, dual fulfillment, the Bible talks about the advent of Christ. But we know that that's not only one advent, it's a second advent of Christ. Christ in his immaculate conception through Mary. But then there's a return of Christ, right? Yes, Joel talks about he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And we see that on the day of Pentecost. But then there's a prophecy that says the reign of the latter house would be greater than the former. And we believe we saw that in 1906 in our modern day Pentecostal movement when William Seymour, hallelujah, and the Azusa Street movement, when there had been a dark season and no sound, and all of a sudden the impact of the Holy Ghost took place again and now it's all over the world. Do a fulfillment and even as you look in Nahum chapter 2 he's prophesying about a judgment that would happen in Nineveh. But also if you look in Nahum chapter 2 he says I see something. The chariots would be racing in the street in the broadways and they would seem as lightning. I believe that what Nahum saw he saw more than the battle. But he saw the vehicles in the road. My God. Why would they, the Bible says, they say, he said, these chariots have torches. Why would the chariots have torches? Because they would have headlights. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying to me. I, my whole point in saying this, if, if you would consider it, uh, that if God says something once, twice you'll hear it. Uh, <laughs> I said, God has spoken once. But twice have I heard it, power still belongs to God. So my whole point is introducing Nahum's vastness and the massness of his message in a minor text. And he's talking to the arrogance of nations who thought they would trump over his people. The Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians and ultimately the Romans. My heart has been heavy this week as I've been praying and interceding for our church members in Falasabad, Pakistan. Many of you all know that we have a school there in Pakistan. And because of their erroneous blasphemy laws, someone made an allegation that one Christian man says something evil against the Quran. And it gave the mob permission to start burning down homes of Christians tearing down crosses off of the churches, ransacking the church's books and Bibles and burning them, even going to the cemetery and desecrating the graves of believers. Yes, I'm thankful that God covered our school, which was only a half a mile away. But at the same time, I can't shake the fact that these evil people did this against defenseless believers but everybody got a day that's what Nahum says Nahum says don't you know that the God we serve will defend his people I need you to tell your neighbor you don't have to fight for yourself the Lord will fight for you Whatever has been trumping over you, whatever's been treading over you, whatever's been plaguing you, whatever's been terrorizing you, some of you have been dealing with suicidal ideations as long as you can remember. Many of you have had to battle depression as long as you remember. You do good for a while and then depression comes on you again. You shout and you praise God, but then you go home.
home and anxiety sits on your chest and you begin to think the worst case scenario on every circumstance and every situation the telephone ringing at night can tear your nerves up I'm talking to some people who are dealing with PTSD you're dealing with trauma the trauma is over but it's still affected you somebody who dealt with molestation somebody who was abused and raped I need you to tell your neighbor tell your neighbor it won't be like this always God is a defense to his people there are some of you have settled in the fact that where you are is how it will always be but I come to tell you something about Satan that you didn't know Satan is a liar my God, he's an intimidator. He's a manipulator. The Bible says he's as a roaring lion. He's not a lion. He's a, he has the sound, but he don't have the teeth. The Bible says the enemy will come against you one way, but it will have to flee seven ways. I need you to just run over to three people in your in your row and tell them, said three people, God is going to fight for you. Uh, we used to say, hold your peace and let the Lord fight your battle. You'll never come out clean fighting in the mud with other people. Some of you, your hardest assignment will be to stand still and not run. I need you to push your neighbor and tell your neighbor, no more quitting, no more running. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I need you to lay your hands on your neighbor's shoulder and say, oh neighbor, said, oh neighbor, God will fight for you. He didn't say that the weapon would not form. He says, but even after the weapon is formed, it will not prosper. I heard David testify and he says, the Lord is my light and my salvation who whom shall I fear the Lord is the strength of my life of whom shall I be afraid when 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 the wicked even my enemies and my foes have me come on came upon me to eat up my flesh God made it fail they stumble and fail get out of your seat and run to somebody tell him he'll fight for you I'm a witness he'll fight for you I'm a witness they sat around and discussed you and in the midst of their rumors God promoted you in the midst of their lies God expanded you tell somebody he'll fight for you uh, this message uh, is not for everybody, uh, but this message uh, is for a remnant of you uh, who have to deal with some things uh, longer than you anticipated. Uh, but Apostle Paul declared, uh, after you've suffered a while, uh, God said, I'll establish you. Uh, I need you to tell your neighbor, uh, say, neighbor, uh, your suffering uh, is almost over. Because he said, if you suffer with me, you'll reign with me. If you go through, I'll bring you out. And you won't come out in the handed. He said, I'll fix it. When you go through the water, and you won't drown. You'll go through the fire, and you won't be burned. Here in the text, Nehemiah says, I need to address your affliction. I need you to tell somebody, God is addressing my affliction. Everybody, everybody has to deal with affliction. Afflictions in your body. Afflictions in your mind. But I got good news. I got good news to everybody that's had to deal with affliction. The good news is many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord, I need you to tell your neighbor, he will deliver. Now y'all just said, come on, grab somebody and say, he will deliver. He will deliver. He will deliver. He 
still deliver. It's almost over. He said, what can you imagine against God? He says, I'll bring it to an end. That's what he said. And he says, when I bring you out of this, your affliction shall not rise up the second time. And as I finish this night, I want to leave this message with you. To everybody that will receive it, I want you to respond in praise. You will never have to deal with this ever again. You will never have to face this again. Get out of your seat and find one of your friends and say, hey, hey, friend. You'll never have to face it again. You passed the test. You took the course. And the Egyptians, you see today, you will see no more forever. Run and find one more person on the back of that. Go tell somebody. Tell them you will never have to deal with it again. You will never have to face it again. Pharaoh's army. Hey! Pharaoh's army. Got drowned in the Red Sea. He's shutting doors behind you. Because some of you, God can't trust you to shut the door. Prophesy to somebody. Tell him he's shutting doors behind you. He's forcing you into your future. I said he's forcing you. I got good news for you. It won't be long from now. Don't tell your neighbor, tell yourself, tell your neighbor, I'll never have to face that again. You trick me once, you won't trick me again. I'll never face it. I'm not telling you I won't have no problems, but count it all joy when you fall into diverse. Oh, I'm on another level now. I'm in a different place. Look at somebody tell them, I'm in a different place, and I'm proud of me. Hey, hey! proud of me because there was a time I would have responded different there was a time I would have went back into the cave but I'm in a different place and this affliction will not rise up the second time and the cancer will not come back a second Pray for everybody, but I need you to help me pray. Lay hands on somebody's shoulder and ask God close the door behind them. Go ahead, go ahead, pray, pray, pray. No more repeats. No more cycles. No more repeats. Come on, begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Ha ha, ya na na no. Shut the door. Shut up, oh, there it is. There's a breakthrough, there's a breakthrough, there's a breakthrough, there's a breakthrough. Because if God is shutting the door behind you, that means there's another door he's bringing you into. If he's shutting the door behind you. Oh, there it is. 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 Oh. Come on, lay hands on somebody's shoulder. Shut, shut the door. Woo. Everybody don't have the capacity to all that you are. Let me see the hands of everybody here who is saved and complicated. Right. I need everybody here 
if you're in covenant with God, but even then, that statement has some inward contradictions. Some of you, the hardest thing you've had to do in this last season is to remain consistent. In the midst of your complicated, in the midst of your contradiction, some of you have to fight to stay consistent. Because some of us started entertaining other options. And I declare to you, the word of the Lord from the prophet Nahum says the affliction, question on the floor, you gotta help me. That the affliction that you've had to carry for a long time, it's about to expire in a short time. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm getting ready to close with this because I need to make sure you understand what I mean. Contradiction. Some of us are so strong and yet so weak all at the same time. Don't y'all look at me like that. Don't leave me out here by myself. Some of us can counsel everybody else. We got advice for everybody else. But when people ask us what we're going to do next, we are scratching our head. Because to be honest, I have no idea. God uses you greatly to heal other people. But if you be honest, there's a contradiction in you healing other people because you are a wounded healer. You are everybody else's encourager while you battle your own insecurities. But the Lord says, tell them, hallelujah. He's bringing an end, hallelujah, to the contradiction. Hallelujah. He says, tell them tonight what they've had to face for a long time. After this season, they'll never have to face it. I need somebody to know in this room, tell your neighbor, you passed. You might not have got an A, you may not have got a B, but a C is still passed. Some of you, it was your participation grade that turned it. Just for showing up. When it was hard to show up, you kept showing up. Hey, when you wanted to quit, you kept showing up. All right. So this, I said all that to say this. I said everybody don't have the capacity for you. Everybody, huh, everybody, don't have the capacity to handle your complications. But I want you to find somebody who loves you enough and I want you to tell them, tell them I'm not intimidated by all that you are. <laughs> tell them I don't see your problem, I see your promise. Oh, come on, tell them you got some funny ways but you still anointed. Why am I saying this? This is why I'm saying this. Because the Lord says, tell them I'm bringing an end to a season. And there's some things that they'll never have to face again. And I know what some of y'all are saying. Oh, when the, when the new year come in, January the 1st, everything going to change for me. That's for them. But for us, we got a prophetic advantage. Our new year is Rosh Hashanah. It comes in September the 15th. That means not many days from now. In less than 30 days, everything is about to change. In less than 30 days, something is about to shift. Oh, no, 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 no. Did 
you find your friend that got the capacity for you all. Grab them by the hand, grab them by the hand, grab them by the hand. Listen. Defeat has a look, but victory has a sound. One of the very first things that happen when fear hits us is we lose our voice. Tell your neighbor, get your voice back. Because we're made in God's image and likeness. Maureen, we're made in his image and likeness. And when God created stuff, he didn't do it with his hands, he did it with his voice. Pull on somebody to tell them you're about to get your voice back. The devil has had you on mute long enough. You are about to get your work. Somebody open up your mouth now and release the sound. Release. Happy anniversary, and we will never have to face it again. fighting for the victory. We're fighting from the victory. It's already done. I want you to lift your hands all over this place. And I've been telling you all service, touch your neighbor. I'm not going to tell you to touch your neighbor right here. Right now, just lift your hands and worship God for what you and God know about. Because this last season for a lot of us has been really complicated. 
but look at the faithfulness of God. Look at the faithfulness of God. for one in your life says oh be lived there and decorate this place with words of adoration. Go ahead and release it now. He didn't change on me. Even when I changed on him, he didn't change on me. You will, you will.
Jesus, the Son. Somebody's affliction is being lifted right now. Of God. Somebody's recommitting their life right now. Oh. Sweet, sweet wonder. Yeah, my na 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 Oh. Come on, sanctify people. Sweet wonder. His name is Jesus. Oh. So.
was just Jesus and which way did he go? He said, I, I don't know all them details. He says, all I know is I was blind. Now I'm sick. I don't have to debate over nobody concerning Yeshua HaMashiach. I don't have to fight nobody over Jesus the Christos. All I know. Somebody jump up and shout, Jesus works for me. Oh, it still works. Everyone stand. Everyone stand. Everyone stand. Everyone stand. Thank you so much. Hallelujah for joining us today. Uh, God has blessed us over these last two years. And I want you to know that it's not a small thing. We don't see it as a small thing that you came to fellowship with us today. And we just thank you so much for your, your heart toward us, all of the preachers, and not just to the guests. I want you to help me celebrate break the Ram Church DMV members. <laughs> Well, one of our Ram Church DMV members, they are transitioning from the church today. <laughs> uh, she's not leaving the Ramp Nation because you got a passport in Ramp Nation. Amen. Uh, she's moving to be closer to her family and she's going to be back at the mother church. But today is Sister Dominique's last Sunday. We love, let's thank God for her. She's been. Listen, Sister Dominique has been serving these last two years. And what some people don't know is that she was coming for the last two years from Woodbridge. Winchester, I'm sorry, Winch oh yeah, Winchester and Woodbridge is two different places. Over an hour and a half, one way on every Tuesday night, on every Sunday, and she didn't miss. She was faithful. She also uh, represented our church with our missions in Guatemala and, uh, and in Brazil. And so, Sister Dominique, we're going to miss having you on that door. But we love you in Jesus' name. We love you. Today when church is over, if you're here today and uh, you may have made a decision at your seat, but you want somebody to pray with you today. If you want information about baptism. If you heard the testimony of God healing the sick. And you have a healing you need in your body. When we close the service out today. We welcome you to come to the altar for prayer. And maybe you're looking for a church home. You can come to the front or you can meet one of the doorkeepers at the door. But again, thank you for being with us. Uplifted hands. Mm, thank you, Jesus. Will you thank him for bringing an end to your affliction? No, praise him because you are less than 27 days from a new year in God. I said you are less than 27 days from a new season in God. And praise him because it starts now. You're coming in with receipts you're coming in now may the grace of our Lord and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest on us rule over us and abide with us henceforth now and forevermore in Jesus name tell somebody you'll never have to face them again